So one, uh, one thing I can start when I was uh, doing the research for this, I went through all our consultants, which we've done a really brilliant job of pruning and getting rid of the old list. And now we have a list that's actually viable, so to speak, that's actually um, useful. And I, wanted, I was just curious to see how many people, how many clients they had and what they were doing in terms of contributing back to the project, the ones that were listed on our consultants page. And it seems to me that we actually have a pretty good contributor set from that page itself. They're not just saprophytes or uh, parasites. They're actually contributing back to the project. Yeah, that's the services and consultants type, yeah. Yeah, so for example, uh, Sylvan Denis and, and uh, uh, has been active very strongly. But we're not counting any of the people in Brazil. Oliviello, for example, is not listed at all. And he used to be, and when I was talking to him in Paris the other month, he was expressing ambivalence about joining that effort again. And Brazil is the biggest uptaker of open office, whether it's Apache open office or, or open office org. I don't think they're doing Libre office. They're doing like the Brazilian version still. Uh, that's a complicated thing. They don't have to use it. No, they do not have to use it. But it was momentum. And then the issue became that Claudio so alienated the people in Brazil who were consulting on this that there's a vituperous hatred almost going on there. It's totally personal, like everything we've, we've encountered with Open Office and LibreOffice. And it makes no sense uh, because it doesn't really help them at all. But anyway, that kind of screwed things up a lot for the Brazilian situation because Brazil, nevertheless, uh, is the largest entity that I know of that's moving en masse over to open office. And they're doing it uh, interestingly, too. They're trying to use um, old technology as well as new technology. Um, and there's several other large polities that are doing it. For example, Russia was doing it massively, as you know. And the thing about Russia is that it's... Um, another way of saying corruption. So um, they have their own companies there, and they only look to their companies. And those are Russian companies. And they moved to open office, and everyone was hating it because it was just so badly done, the management over it. But uh, we had nothing listed there. We had nothing listed in India. India has massive migration to open office again. We don't list it. Yeah. Any other product, no matter what its price, you can rely on going to the company and say, here's my RFQ, fill out these 20 pages, and sign this license declaration, explain exactly what you have, and then we'll discuss the price. But the cost of getting in the door is that 20 page, you know, that's the documentation that you have to fill out. government's changing because the Bureau of Procurement is going to the store. So, okay. But the point is still well made because, for example, this is what I encountered when I was doing open office and I was trying to get governments actually to adopt it, is that you have to follow the protocols. Even though there's change, that change is done at the swift pace of a snail going uphill. I mean, it it's, doesn't go overnight. So you have to follow the protocols. There has to be a RFP issue, you know, request for proposals. You have to attend to all the protocols. If you don't, you simply are not paid attention to. Open source is not given very much um, credibility, and it's not really looked to because, as we all know, when the government or when any large ent entity, especially in the public sector, looks to it, they think, oh my god, a bunch of rabble are developing this. Who is going to be liable for something going wrong? And I encounter this everywhere in the world especially in Canada, though. So the more, um, uh, the, the countries that are predicated more on the model of Sweden or uh, Japan, where you have massive corporations that are essentially determining the role of the, uh, the, the, the running of the economy, the more difficult it is for them to adopt something like open source um, internally. They have to go through the protocols. And what's more, they're going to be almost always going to the same old vendors as before. So the thing is, you don't buck that trend. You just work with it. Well, I'll, give, I'll give you a specific example that's come up several times. Right? Yeah. The devils. And that's a company comes in and says, we've been doing an audit. We found out we need to ask you, does open office meet Department of Defense security requirements? Yes, I've encountered that many times. That's a, yeah. That's yeah. a transfer of effort from the, the, the organization, the department using it. They've decided instead of doing their own security audit or every program, Vendor by defining a standard someplace and asking the vendor, but kind of certifying it. And that doesn't, 
Do you think it's coincidence? Don't you think it's tactical? Yeah. It's totally tactical. It's a way that uh, the private proprietary company. Well, you know, the ecosystem, but the, 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 the you run the farm who in the ecosystem is going to do that effort themselves to serve by the open source product? No, and of course. Knowing that all their competitors uh, automatically Well, that, that's why it's a brilliant tactical move. Yeah, and it, well, it's, it's, it's a move basically to get rid of open source as a competitor because you just say, okay, these people simply cannot match or cannot come up to the table with this. And I encountered this in Canada, I encountered this in Japan, I've encountered this in Australia even. Less in Germany. Quite. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But you know how long it's taken, Jan, for us to get to that point in Europe? About five years, yeah. At least. <laughs> and basically, Neely has been really strongly driving elements of that. Um, she's perhaps the smartest woman out there in, in this field, and she's actually pretty good about this. But at the same time, she also hasn't done exactly what we would like, but it's taken a long time for us to get there. And there are also places like, for example, in uh, South Tyrol that are manipulating the term open source to their own benefit. So it's... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, Tor was behind it to some extent, or was involved, and Tor was essentially funded by the Defense Department. So, I mean, so the, so the question is, I mean, but I, I went, this was essentially not for this audience, this presentation, so that's why I'm not boring you with it. But I, very briefly, it comes down to, um, uh, essentially just this thing is, we have right now an emerging class of people who are providing professional services. Uh, it's actually really pretty good, and, and it's, the people who are doing it are contributors to our community. Uh, it's on a desktop, though. That's one point I want to focus on. And the thing is that right now, say there are a billion people who are using computers, probably a billion and a half at this point. Almost all of them are using it on the desktop for work. So it's not like we're exactly disappearing into the past. The desktop is going to be lingering with us for some time. But I had the feeling that if I'm a large entity, I mean, it's public sector or private enterprise, I'm going to be looking for mobile applications also and mobile uses. I'm not just going to assume that all the people who are going to be using my services are going to be using a desktop. Even though if they're going to be doing spreadsheet, spreadsheets, they're almost invariably going to be sitting down on a typewriter and keyboard and whatever. They're going to be looking at mobile devices when they start looking at purchases. And so the big question I have here, what, what can we do to, to uh, address this? Can we encourage something like this to um, get people to start developing it? Do we need to start a whole new project? This is what we did with Open Office, is that it just became totally outside of Sun's purview and also Oracle's to think about including something like mobile devices or mobile applications with Open, open Office. Well, with mobile, I think that does actually raise that issue. New code base, new code architecture. But I think that unless we have something like an ODF editor, we're going to be thought of as being dinosaurs. We're innovating faster now than ever before, but we're still not necessarily getting to the right point where people I might look to it. I would say even more than just being on, having a client on mobile, yeah. so mobile and, and tablet, it's also having the documents in the cloud. That's exactly it, yeah. We want, yeah. Yes, and actually, that's something that's cool. Yeah. I think of, you know, Google Docs or the Google Drive. Now suddenly the storage is also the editor to some degree. 
Mm -hmm. Especially with we see with Box and Dropbox right now. Well, the scare, Dave, the scary thing about this is that we had almost exactly the same conversation in 2004. And uh, at the time, I thought, yeah, this is the way we have to go. But we didn't, because Sun at the time was so committed to his own idea of just developing this for the desktop that this is exactly, I mean, it's been IBM's vision for the last you know, 15, 20 years, if not longer. And it's been everyone's vision now for the last 10 years, if not longer. And yet we're not there yet. And open source would seem to be there. So what's the obstacle? The obstacle, from my perspective, is obviously the one that we're seeing now with Microsoft finally coming out with something for the iPad, is that you're waiting for the gorilla in the corner to actually act. And then maybe then you can do your own little thing. But part of it is, OK, Google a few years ago acquired Office, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was a nice little touch, wasn't it? Then Apple did the same thing. Yeah. You know how many uh, developers are really annoyed with Apple for that? So, yeah, that, that's that part. The question is, I mean, open source is not just free. There's other parts of it. If it's open source, there's also the ability to move it forward. I mean, when Google did Quick Office, they had essentially bolted it to their Google Drive. That was no longer you know, they could be connected. Yeah. I absolutely don't want to port it at all. I think porting is beside the port. Well, porting is so last century. Yeah, it would be technically hideous, and it wouldn't be fun. I think yeah. The nice thing about a new code base is it can be fun. Yes. I mean, I think that Andrew's point is really brilliant here, is that just this vision of just imagining a kind of uh, document that can be existing in the cloud and that can be accessible to using various APIs, it's almost like Wolfram, to actually develop it in ways that you think are appropriate for the purpose at hand. And the technologies would actually really already be there. And so the thing that would be of use for us would be presumably to standardize those APIs or those protocols so that the document could actually be addressable by any other tools. Well, I, think, I think it's also a good fortune that the current code base we have that can be in ways repurposed it as the, you know, one of the main pieces understood by the system. So you, you might have those different pieces where you have the document translation be an entry and potentially an exit. Right. But then have the editing of the documents be. I think that could actually be left for people to come up with. Oh, actually, now this is the last theory of everything. Microsoft's theory of everything. So it's like every possible type of edge you might want is probably going to land in that stack. No more. And then, then you'll have perfect interoperability with ODF editors and with Microsoft. Well, that's why I was thinking the whole term good enough. Uh, so that it's ad hoc good enough. You don't want a complete office package here. Exactly. And interestingly enough, I was working with this developer, Peter Kelly, who did UX Write, and he's still, doing, he's still going gangbusters in Thailand. He's by himself. He's a, a, a professor of CS in Australia and then moved to Thailand uh, for interesting reasons. And I can't really blame where he's living. He's living in paradise in some ways, assuming there's no tsunami. But he's working on this brilliant version of an uh, editor, native editor on iOS. And he has this as a, on his agenda something for ODT. And he's just working entirely in WebKit and JavaScript, which is really kind of challenging if you think about it. So, but it works really fast. But it doesn't have collaboration, let us say, uh, tracking, no change tracking yet. That's essential. However, he is thinking very long, much, very much along the lines of Andrew here. He and as Dave is suggesting too, only he would want to standard create an open source project or something on Oasis even that would standardize the protocols for cloud services generally for storing documents in a cloud, accessing them, and then being able to manipulate those documents in there. Because right now. Every cloud service, so to speak, or every remote server has its own protocols and APIs. There is no harmony. And this causes a lot of grief for developers. 
because they have to write a whole, they have to address each one of these APIs for every kind of document they're working on. So that would be one thing, establishing, say, an Oasis program or even uh, something that Microsoft is friendly to, um, and having the same old usual suspects join it and then more. And make, it, make the claim that right now, you know, the cloud is, is, is great, but really the cloud is more like clouds. And that we want it to be harmonized and we want it to be standardized. Two, to then raise this point that Andrew and Dave were raising and, and, and Rob of what could be in a more efficient way of envisioning how people work on documents in the cloud. Rather than having clients, rather than having anything else like this, what is the future pr uh, perspective of working on the cloud? and then have this as a project. Now the problem is we need funding. I mean, it's an exciting, to me it's an extremely exciting vision because I think this actually could, could happen. What company out there, what big company out there would benefit most from a non-Windows OS, non-Android, or at least non-Google Android editor out there? Facebook? Facebook? Twitter? No. Twitter? I know people at Facebook and Twitter both, but. They do. The problem is but I don't think they, they need to have complex formatting in their documents. No, well. And, and so the, the fact that you can add text with titles is all they want and all they need. Yeah, that's, I can't think of too many places that would really want it except when you start thinking into education, you come up with Pearson. And Pearson basically, I don't know if you know anything about Pearson, the company, it's everyone who deals with education material knows Pearson. They are a behemoth uh, in the field, and they're also uh, ancient uh, in terms of their perspective and in terms of their ability to move quickly. They are as, about as agile as a uh, brontosaurus, which never existed anyway, but call it aptosaurus. They simply are not agile. However, they're incredibly powerful and big. But that's the kind of company that might be interested in something like this simply because it would help. O'Reilly is another one that is a lot more exciting to think about. And they've just come up with Atlas, which is actually pretty good for editing. Um, and it's actually very um, much, it, it's worthwhile looking into, but that's the kind of company that would be interested, to it, interested in this. In other words, editing companies. And they also have a lot of um, wherewithal. But these are the, that, that's the biggest problem I can think of, is that all these ideas just expanding it, for example, education, working as we've done before with uh, students and also in getting people to use it, both on desktop, but also in some sort of mobile device, device and getting students to write to this. Mentoring, we don't have, we, we be useful to have mentoring programs, but to be local mentoring. Uh, for example, in Germany, we used to have <coughs> a lot more mentoring programs, but they were very local. They were funded by local organizations there. Likewise with uh, extensions, hackathons, and QA marathons. These things expand the community and they can be directed, but we need funding for all this. Mm -hmm. now has a laptop for every child in the middle school. Uh, not a laptop, I'm sorry, an iPad. And the iPad comes with a keyboard. And when they are doing composition, mm -hmm. they're typing in their, their composition. But yeah. it's not in Microsoft Word, it's not in OpenOffice. It's basically to a, a modem this. Right. Right. And so it is interesting as we move to these new form, of, or form factors, mm -hmm. when you're seeing typewriters, and then when you publish it, it gets formatted. When I was a writer uh, and sending things to editors, the editors insisted, as David's mentioning, that you only send it in as text. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. But there's this expression about what does it mean to have a powerful tool, powerful tool. And we, we've come from an age, I think, where something that has a million options and that 20 level deep dialogue that allow you to scribble every little bit of line space and character space. Call us the so age of Microsoft. Yeah, that was the definition of power. I mm -hmm. have a powerful tool because of what it allows me to do. And then the other definition of power is kind of more specific one that says a tool is most powerful based on what it allows me not to think about. 
Well, this is exactly the argument that we used to have before. For example, who here actually uses Vim for composing text? So, okay, I use Vim, and I, but, right, but I do what I use for just writing this actually was as, as even more rudimentary editor. I just use Markdown, and then I transferred it over to Open Office. I do, n I never use a fancy text editor. It's, it's just as easier, and I, I, I want to train myself for Markdown too, but also I use you know, TXT, any editor for TXT, something that takes up almost no space on my computer, basically. And Vim is great. And you still want it to look good in the end. You need ways of making it look good. You just don't want to have that be what the user review tool is obsessing about. Correct. They should be obsessing about the communication. Well, that was the argument against Microsoft and, and the, 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 the distraction that was introduced by PowerPoint, both in terms of the bullet but also just in terms of the amount of time one was spending in creating fancy presentations. But the point that you're raising here is also that the power here, I think, would be how capable is any kind of device to have ad hoc uh, tools thrown into it. So for example, if I want fancy editing here, if I want to have images, if I want to have some sort of movie thrown in there, then I should be able to do it, but I shouldn't have to worry about being able to do it all the time or have to worry about how to do it precisely. It should be available f for me to access. Yeah, and something like that that we can promote as a vision perhaps for a kind of uh, future or a something that would be interesting to work on, to develop, to flesh out. Um, Well, Dave, you've been with Apache a long time, right? Yeah, since uh, oh, 2006. Right. So, for example, this, how would one, could one establish a project in Apache I mean, along these lines? Say, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was my opportunity. I just thought of Robin as a potato. Yeah, because I was thinking, you know, I mean, something would be, uh, that could be designed and shaped and then kind of broadcast. Well, That's what I was wondering, yeah. What was that? The, the, the app you talked about was UX right? UX right. Yeah, and if the author there had an interest in it. So he would, actually. Um, and um, he would be very interested probably in, I've been, I've been moving him over to turn everything to open source. He's been very reluctant, the way most small entre entrepreneurs are. But I've been pointing out to him that he could actually get a quite interested community around what he's doing that would actually benefit him in the end. Um, but he would be very interested in probably contributing to something like this. Because I think... Well, I think it'd just be interesting to look to because, for example, the keynote today, the whole pr uh, uh, 
conference this time is been focusing on the cloud um, and the way in which Apache is able to present it. They didn't know it wasn't really about the cloud here. But the thing is that we can take advantage of that by saying, OK, so Apache is taking the cloud seriously and wants to make it free and also wants to develop interesting technology. And it's already done a good job of it for making up the cloud. So let's look to how this would work with something like OpenOffice, which is one of the few user-specific tools that Apache is housing. Yeah. Are already embedded into projects like Apache Pika, mm -hmm. which is the basis for a lot of cloud technology for that to be based in text and abstraction and frameworks. And That's great. So that could actually be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. I see that as one of the major problems at the moment. Yeah. Someone still yeah. has money who wants to yeah. put it in to see something. But I think that. in this, the, one of the things is this idea of project from scratch, and you can contribute to it. You can't you can have a project that assumes that your official contributors are all going to be giants. Well, if you look at the uh, German based Open Source Business Alliance, um, which you know about the one that Peter Garnett is, is behind or is, is driving. They just got 200,000 euros, I think, to develop uh, advancements for um, LibreOffice or OpenOffice. Um, this doesn't really matter. To, and they, Peter was telling me, I mean, that the German government, or EU government rather, would be probably interested in contributing more. There's more money out there. And he himself runs a company, Univention, that is replacing Microsoft servers with Linux servers. So Probably six people. <laughs> so one thing that would be useful to look at is who would be the users of something like this. And I'm always imagining it's going to be enterprise size groups or entities. So it could be anyone who decides to move away from SharePoint, to move away from Microsoft Office, to move away from Google even, or want to use Google too. But we're talking large size entities. And it could be individuals too, but I'm. Yeah, you and Jonathan Schwartz. Um, um, it's, it could be individual private people. I'm not opposed to that. I just think that one thing that would be useful for getting money, for example, or for getting funding generally, would be if enterprises perceived that this was actually something that they might want to have, um, because it would be a way of them moving away from Microsoft and away from costly or more costly alternatives. I know how to phrase it. You have layering it. I realize it's. Absolutely brilliant. It's, it's your do-it-yourself uh, world of the, of the cloud basically holds open. I also think the idea of moving off of something like SharePoint and yeah. all this new, the problem with that is in some ways the, the problem that OpenOffice had back in the day when mm -hmm. they were trying to move people off Microsoft Office and on, and you suddenly have this massive requirement of interoperability Mm -hmm. and, and a hundred percent feature compliance and it's this battle right. whereas the way services get taken up in, in data centers I think you know, more often you are a self-contained service that 
mm -hmm. does something useful. And if you make something that does something useful enough, it will show up. Mm -hmm. Right. What if you focus on Absolutely. My enterprise is also me education. I know that your son is taking, you know, is being required to use a very minimal uh, tool, but uh, education is also uh, things that are happening in India, China, and around the world, and in MOOCs, where people are going to be wanting some sort of more sophisticated tool, and this would actually be satisfying some of those needs. No, I mean, uh, he's. He's being required to be minimal <laughs> in not having any formatting on in the documents that he's writing, you said. Because it's. I, I don't. I think that's more a, a feature of the process than of the I understand that. Right, right I understand. It's not wanted, so it's, yeah. there's no. Right. Um, but elsewhere, they might want more. And the other thing they do is they, they blindly use Google Docs, and it works fantastic for them because they can touch it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And they can share with their parents. Especially if they're. It works really, really well. And there aren't documents that you're sending around that people can't open. Yes, I know. Yeah. Well, you've got companies like Box. All, there, all they are is a, a storage spot. And you don't necessarily have any application on it. Uh, they actually were developing, and they're going to be developing more. But the problem with all these American companies is that they don't work so well across any body of ocean. Uh, because countries elsewhere say, no, we don't want that. We have certain requirements. Yeah, I was putting it in a different way. So I guess my point is that there can be local solutions too. But NSA is everywhere. And NSA is more ubiquitous than God, it seems. Um, so I think that it'd be worthwhile to investigate this publicly on the open office, open office org list or Apache list to see whether we can start actually making this real. And also on the uh, other lists that would be relevant. Because I really do think that it's a bit of a, th not so much threat, but a um, precipice that we're heading toward. Yes, I know. I'm going to start doing this. Who wants to join? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And yeah. I'm always worried about that because, you know, it. I think, you know, yeah. yeah. As I also say, doing the components might be less threatening than doing an app because if mm -hmm. you're doing an app, you can compete with everyone who's doing an app. I'm if you're doing a component, you're enabling everyone who wants to write an app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to be bigger, you want to be huge. And the, or famous or, or big. And possibly be big but not be a household name. Like this component. Well, Flex is working on Flex data, which is a JavaScript version. Okay. So, I mean, so you start having the ability to shape a UI to something that you can deliver in HTML. I should look into it. Um, I'll, I'll contact my friend Peter, see what, because uh, he'd be exactly the kind of developer you're talking about, Andrew, who is extremely sharp and would probably excite people simply because he's been able to shove a camel through a needle, um, through the eye of a needle. I mean, it's, he's done pr you know, prodigious work, so he'd be really kind of interesting to, to look to see how his son is coding. And he might actually find this interesting. But uh, I agree, we do need a developer who's actually able to do interesting work that people can then follow or argue against.
So, by the way, if anyone's... So I, I guess we're about out of time, but for the next group. Um, by the way, I, I did this all on, I finally did this all on 4.1, uh, release two. Thank you, uh, Jurgen. Um, it's awesome. It actually works much faster than even release one. So it's very good indeed. Oh, I was also curious about LibreOffice's uh, relationship to consultants, innovation, whatever. It doesn't have one, really. What it comes down to. They have a support page, but their support page is not really here nor there. Yes, actually it does. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so the problem that we have, of course, is that the media is biased against us in I don't think it's affecting usage. But it's kind of, you saw this OpenOffice doesn't work. Yeah. A lot of people had titles. And the titles. But we, we try to get rid of the titles all the time. But I mean, to, to, to some audiences. Yeah. They love the them. The title gives them legitimacy and makes it sound like the product's more serious because you have someone who's the, you know, the, the, the French yeah. you know, marketing director or whatever. It, it sounds more corporate. And I mean, I've actually found it entirely different directors. Which I like. I much prefer yeah. it that way. I think it's a healthy thing. Well, thank you guys for being here. I think that this, your ideas are great. Um, I think that we should just act on it. <laughs>